Classical Greece, 499 to 338 BCE, Part 3. Greek religion. As was the case throughout the ancient world of antiquity, religion played an important role in Greek society and was intricately connected to every aspect of daily life. It was both social and practical. Public festivals, which originated from religious practices, served specific functions. Boys were prepared to be warriors, girls to be mothers. Because religion was related to every aspect of life, citizens had to have a proper attitude toward the gods. Religion was a civic cult necessary for the well-being of the state. Temples dedicated to a god or goddess were the major buildings in Greek cities. The poetry of Homer gave an account of the gods that provided Greek religion with a definite structure. Over a period of time, all Greeks came to accept a basic polytheistic religion with twelve chief gods who supposedly lived on Mount Olympus, the highest mountain in all of Greece. Among the twelve were Zeus, the chief deity and father of the gods, Athena, goddess of wisdom and crafts, Apollo, god of the sun and poetry, Aphrodite, goddess of love, and Poseidon, brother of Zeus and god of the seas and earthquakes. Although the twelve Olympian gods were common to all Greeks, each polis usually singled out one of the twelve as a guardian deity for the community. Athena was the patron goddess of Athens, for example, and she presided in the Parthenon. Because the Greeks wanted the gods to look favorably on their activities, ritual assumed enormous proportions in Greek religion. Prayers were often combined with gifts to the gods based on the principle I give so that you, the gods, will give in return. Ritual meant sacrifices, whether of animals or agricultural products. Animal sacrifices were burned on an altar in, co in front of a temple or a, on a small altar in front of a home. Festivals also developed as a way to honor the gods and goddesses. Some of these, the Panhellenic celebrations, for example, came to have international significance and were held at special occasions, such as those dedicated to the worship of Zeus at Olympia or to Apollo at Delphi. Numerous events were held in honor of the gods at the great festivals, including the athletic competitions to which all Greeks were invited. According to tradition, such games were first held at the Olympic festival in 776 BCE and then held every four years after their ap uh, afterward to honor Zeus. Initially, the Olympic contests consisted of foot races, and wrestling. The latter, boxing, javelin throwing, and various other contests were added. Competitions were always between individuals, not groups, and were not without danger to the participants. Athletes competed in the nude. That meant that the foot races were held in the nude as well as the wrestling, and rules were rather relaxed. Wrestlers, for example, were allowed to gorge eyes out and even pick up their competitors and bring them down head first onto a hard surface. The Greek Olympic Games came to an end in the year 393 CE when a Christian Roman emperor banned them as pagans exercises. 1,500 years later, however, the games were revived through the efforts of a French baron, Pierre de Coubertin. In 1896, the first modern Olympic Games were held in Athens, Greece. As another practice, practical side of Greek religion, Greeks wanted to know the will of the gods. In order to do so, they made use of the oracle, a sacred shrine dedicated to a god or a goddess who revealed the future. The most famous was the oracle of Apollo at Delphi, located on the side of Mount Parnassus, overlooking the Gulf of Corinth. At Delphi, a priestess listened to questions while in a state of ecstasy that was believed to be induced by Apollo. Her responses were interpreted by the priests and given in verse form to the pr person to asking questions. Representatives of states and individuals traveled to Delphi to consult the Oracle of Apollo. States might inquire whether they should undertake a military expedition. Individuals might raise such questions as Heraclitus asked whether he will have offspring from the wife as he has now. Responses were often enigmatic and at times even politically motivated. Croesus, the king of Lydia in Asia Minor, who was known for his incredible wealth, sent messengers to the oracle at Delphi asking whether he should go to war with the Persians. The oracle replied that if Croesus attacked the Persians, he would destroy a mighty empire. 
Overjoyed to hear these words, Croesus made war on the Persians, but was crushed. A mighty empire was indeed destroyed, that of his own. The Axial Age, 700 to 300 BCE. We see this in China, India, Southwest Asia, and the Mediterranean. By the 4th century BCE, important regional civilizations existed in China, India, Southwest Asia, and the Mediterranean. During their formative periods between 700 and 300 BCE, all were characterized by the emergence of religious and philosophical thinkers who established ideas or axes that remained the basis for religious and philosophical thought in those societies for hundreds of years. Hence, some historians have referred to the period when these ideas developed as the Axial Age, first coined by Karl Jaspers. During the 5th and 4th centuries in Greece, the philosophers Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle not only proposed philosophical and political ideas crucial to the Greek world and later to Roman and Western civilization, but also conceived of a rational method of inquiry that became important to modern science. By the 7th century BCE, concepts of monotheism had developed in Persia through the teaching of Zoroaster and in Canaan through the Hebrew prophets. In Judaism, the Hebrews developed a world religion that influenced the latter religions of Christianity and Islam. Of course, they are known as the Abrahamic faiths. During the 6th century, two major schools of thought, that of Confucianism and Taoism, emerged in China. Both sought to spell out the principles that would create a stable order in society, and although their views of reality were diametrically opposed, both came to have an impact on Chinese civilization that lasted into the 20th century. Two of the world's greatest religions, Hinduism and Buddhism, began in India during the Axial Age. Hinduism was an outgrowth of the religious beliefs of the Aryan peoples who settled in India. These ideas were expressed in the sacred text known as the Vedas and in the Upanishads, which were commentaries on the Vedas compiled in the 6th century BCE. With its belief in reincarnation, Hinduism proved justification for India's rigid class system. Buddhism was the product of one man, Siddhartha Gautama, known as the Buddha, who lived in the 6th century BCE. The Buddha's simple message of achieving wisdom created a new spiritual philosophy that would rival Hinduism. Although a product of India, Buddhism also spread to other parts of the world. Although these philosophies and religions developed in different areas of the world, they had some features in common. They existed at the same time, between 700 and 300 BCE. Like the Chinese philosophers of Confucius and Lao Tzu, the Greek philosophers Plato and Aristotle had different ideas about the nature of reality. Thinkers in India and China also developed rational methods of inquiry similar to those of Plato and Aristotle. And regardless of their origins, when we speak of Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, or Greek philosophical thought, we realize that the ideas of the Axial Age from 700 to 300 BCE not only spread around the world at different times, but are also still an integral part of our contemporary world today. We might ask, what do historians mean when they speak of the actual age? What do you think could explain the emergence of similar ideas in different parts of the world during this period? The polis was above all a male community. Only adult male citizens took part in public life. In Athens, this meant the exclusion of women, slaves, and foreign residents, or roughly 85% of the total population in Attica. There were probably 150,000 citizens in Athens, of whom about 43,000 were adult males who exercised political power. And so only 43,000 of the 150,000 citizens uh, actually had power. Resident foreigners who numbered about 35,000 received the protection of the laws but were also subject to some of the responsibilities of citizens, namely military service and the funding of festivals. The remaining social group, the slaves, numbered around 100,000. Most slaves in Athens worked in the home as cooks and maids or toiled in the fields. Some were owned by the state and worked on public construction projects. I do want to briefly mention uh, women in Athens and Sparta. <clears throat> Of course, in classical Athens, a woman's place was in the home. She had two major responsibilities as a wife-bearing and raising children and managing the household. In the first selection from a dialogue on estate management, uh, read Xenophon, his O Economicus, who relates the instructions of an Athenian to his new wife. Although women in Sparta had the same responsibilities as women in Athens, 
they assumed somewhat different roles as a result of the Spartan lifestyle. The second, third, and fourth selections, for example, demonstrate these differences as seen in the accounts of three ancient Greek writers. You could see Xenophon and his Constitution of the Spartans, Aristotle's Politics, and Plutarch's Lycurgus. And so we have an examination of the writings of Xenophon, Aristotle, and Plutarch. Concerning economy and lifestyle, the Athenian economy was based largely on agriculture and trade. Athenians grew grains, vegetables, and fruit for local consumption. Grapes and olives were cultivated for wine and olive oil, which were used locally and also exported. The Athenians raised sheep and goats for wool and dairy products. Because of the size of the population in Attica and the lack of abundant fertile land, Athens had to import 50 to 80 percent of its grain, a staple in Athenian diet. Trade was thus very important to the Athenian economy. Perhaps that is one reason why the Greeks were among the first to mint silver coins. The Athenian lifestyle was basically simple. Athenian houses were furnished with necessities brought from artisans such as beds, couches, tables, chests, pottery, stools, baskets, and cooking utensils. Wives and slaves made clothes and blankets at home. The Athenian diet was rather plain and relied on such basic foods as barley, wheat, millet, lentils, grapes, figs, olives, almonds, bread, vegetables, eggs, fish, cheese, and chicken. Olive oil was a widely used but, but not only for eating but also for burning in lamps and rubbing on the body after washing and exercise. Although con uh, country houses kept animals, they were used for reasons other than their flesh, oxygen, or oxen for plowing, sheep for wool, and goats for milk and cheese. Concerning the family and relationships, the family was a central institution in ancient Athens. It was composed of a husband, wife, and children, a nuclear family. Although other dependent relatives and slaves were regarded as part of the family economic unit, the family's primary social function was to produce new citizens. Strict laws enacted in the 5th century stipulated that a citizen must be the offspring of a legally acknowledged marriage between two Athenian citizens whose parents were also citizens. Adult, male, adult female citizens could participate in most religious cults and festivals, but they were otherwise excluded from public life. They could not own property beyond personal items and always had a male guardian. An Athenian woman was expected to be a good wife. Her foremost obligation was to bear children, especially male children who would preserve the family line. A wife was also to take care of her family and her house, either doing the household work herself or supervising the slaves who did the actual work. Women were kept under strict control. Because they were married at 14 or 15, they were taught about their responsibilities at an early age. Although many managed to learn to read and play musical instruments, they were not given any formal education, and women were expected to remain at home out of sight unless attending funeral or festival. If they left the house, they were to be accompanied. A woman working alone in public was either poverty-stricken or not a citizen. Of course, you know Plato uh, thought that women and males should both be educated, uh, although it didn't happen. Uh, male homosexuality was also a prominent feature of Athenian life. The Greek homosexual ideal was a relationship between a mature man and a young male. It is most likely that this was an aristocratic ideal and not one practiced by the common people. While the relationship was frequently physical between the mature male and its young male counterpart, the Greeks also viewed it as educational. The older male, or the lover, won the love of his beloved through his value as a teacher and the devotion he demonstrated in training his charge. In a sense, this love relationship was seen as a way of in initiating young males into the male world of political and military dominance. The Greeks did not feel that the coexistence of homosexual and heterosexual uh, predilections created any special problems for individuals or their society. And so then you might want to read Plato's dialogue Symposium, which is a treatise on love.